Hello, I'm Ryan Boll, a Stratfor Middle East and North Africa analyst at Rain. This podcast is brought to you by Worldview, Rain's premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Sign up for our free newsletter at worldview.stratfor.com. You are listening to Rain's Essential Geopolitics podcast, powered by Stratfor. I'm Emily Donahue. There have been a number of trade-related developments for the U.S. since August, from complicated relations between the U.S. and China over Taiwan to the Australia-U.S. nuclear submarine deal and its fallout. Here with guidance on several of these developments is Matthew Bay, Stratfor Senior Global Analyst at Rain. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Emily. So, Kim, let's talk about Taiwan first. Um, China and Taiwan have both applied for the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. What are both trying to achieve with that? Right. So both China and Taiwan have an interest in joining CPTPP to broaden their um, trade relations within within Asia, particularly as from, from the context of China, for example, um, the United States is trying to be more aggressive in getting some of um, China's largest trading partners in Asia on board with the U.S. kind of pressure campaign against China's um, behavior in the region, whether you want to talk about that behavior being from a trade perspective or a defense policy perspective or a technology perspective. Um, however, um, Taiwan... Um, because obviously it's got a lot of very complicated relationships with, with countries in the region in terms of recognition um, and trading relationships. Um, it's trying to join that as a, a way to broaden its trade horizons as well. Um, however, of course, um, it doesn't have a lot of established trade relations because it's, a, it's a, obviously a, its international status has been disputed. Um, but that's what they're obviously trying to do. And they do have some support. Um, Japan, or at least a number of people within the the ruling Japanese party, the LDP, have been backing Taiwan's potential accession to the to the agreement. Matthew, is either Taiwan or China likely to join? So both of them have an uphill battle when it comes to actually getting um, most of the members for CPTPP to actually approve their membership. Um, China has a lot of issues. CPTPP was originally designed by the United States as a way to create a very advanced trade agreement that had a lot of things beyond just re- uh, reducing tariffs. So it includes a lot of details around um, you know, um, issues around rules of origin. It has a lot of standards when it comes to environmental issues. It has a lot of standards when it comes to um, IP protection. These are things that China generally, when it negotiates free trade agreements, doesn't uh, uh, agree to. So China would have to do a lot of reforms internally, um, but they might not be willing to actually make on the timeline needed to join the trade pact in order for them to actually join. Not to mention the United States will be putting a ton of pressure um, on uh, different members within uh, within different members of CPTPP to not allow and not back a, a, China, a China entry. Um, on Taiwan's perspective, the biggest problem is, of course, that any country that, you know, um, would accept or vote for for Taiwan to join CPTPP would be putting a target on their back. Um, China would view that as essentially that country recognizing Taiwan as an independent country, and then would put, would probably and almost certainly in some cases retaliate um, with uh, with some sort of trade measures or other diplomatic action. Um, and given a lot of the Asian economies or CPTPP members. Um, dependence on China, that's going to provoke backlash that they probably don't want, which is why Taiwan also probably unlikely to get enough votes to actually join. Will either of these situations cause the Biden administration to reconsider the U.S. joining the pact? So, I mean, the reason why the U.S. pulled out of the TPP at the time before it became the CPTPP um, is very complex. I mean, from a strategic perspective, you can make the argument that the U.S. should try to rejoin it as a way to really be an anchor of its policy against China, you know, having this uh, broad trade group that has high standards for trade, etc. Um, that would make a lot of sense. However, um, domestically, the political environment for signing new trade deals or expanding U.S. trade relations through FTAs is just... It's, it's just not a realistic domestic political possibility right now. Um, if you look at the way that the U.S. environment uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, both of them have become more hardline on trade. Of course, Donald Trump um, really kind of embodied that 
Um, so there's a lot of domestic impediments that would come up in that. Now, the Biden administration has said that they would be willing to re-enter or reconsider, I guess, uh, re-entry um, if there are stronger, uh, stronger mechanisms around labor and environmental issues. Um, that could help. However, there are two other challenges that would need to be navigated for, for, for that to happen. Um, the first being that right now, um, the U.S. president doesn't have what's called the Trade Promotion Authority to, to, to sign trade agreements. That law lapsed earlier this year, and why that's important is because it essentially makes it a lot easier for presidents to sign um, trade agreements, um, and, if with, and without it, that means that any kind of trade agreement would have to uh, be submitted to Congress. It does under the TPA, but under the TPA, you didn't have to have um, uh, get around a filibuster. It basically made it a yes-no vote. Um, now, if you were to submit an, an agreement, you would have to make it subject to a filibuster. So that would be a very difficult thing politically to do. Um, and then finally, so a lot of the things that would be negotiated in CPTPP for at least um, Canada-U.S. Uh, trade relations and Mexico-U.S. trade relations were just negotiated under the USMCA. And the USMCA put into place a lot higher restrictions on, for example, the auto sector and the rules of origin for, for whether or not a, a vehicle or a vehicle part qualified for uh, free trade access under, an, under USMCA. Um, a lot of those would have to be renegotiated, re-put re into the, the CPTPP, which, if you actually go back to the original text of TPP, actually reduced the requirements for Mexico and Canada uh, in their auto sector uh, when it came to being able to qualify uh, for, for, at the time, NAFTA access. Oh, so this is like a complete pretzel of a tangle. Yes, it is, ex exactly. And it'll be very difficult for the U.S. to navigate that on a timely fashion, not to mention domestic approval here, here in the States. So let's talk about the U.S. trade relationship with China. Can you update us on that? Yeah, so the President Trump, when he came to office, did uh, initiate a, a, a review of U.S.-China trade policy and, and as a part of a broader uh, review of U.S. policy towards China at large. Um, but we really, that has been really silent and we've had crickets on it really for most of the, the Biden administration's time in office. Um, there has been leaks that the, that the um, USTR so the United States Trade Representative is considering a, a what's called a Section 301 investigation. That's the same type of investigation that is underpinning all of the tariffs on China right now um, into uh, an investigation into whether or not China's use of subsidies to support industries hurts uh, U.S. Uh, commerce. And what that can be used is the actually authorization of even more tariffs. Um, so the Biden administration um, is looking at that phase one trade deal, which does expire at the end of the year, and looking at ways to gain leverage if it ever does enter talks uh, uh, with China. Um, I don't think we're going to see a holistically, you know, a much higher tariffs than we already see. I mean, over half of the U.S. imports from China are subject to additional tariffs. Um, I think that the administration wants to have that investigation um, to be used as leverage and then also, yes, put more tariffs potentially if those talks break down again uh, on, on China, but at the same time using it as a way to also um, offset maybe some targeted reduction of tariffs and some of those tariffs that are actually hurting specific industries um, very hard. Um, a lot of the tariffs, for example, are targeting um, intermediate goods, uh, which is having an impact and had an impact on their uh, manufacturing sector even before the pandemic. Another surprisingly intricate trade relationship for the U.S. has turned out to be with the United Kingdom. Uh, can you talk about U.K.-U.S. options when it comes to trade? Right. Uh, Boris Johnson basically admitted that, there, that the promise that they could easily sign a free trade agreement with the U.S. during the Brexit campaign um, isn't really all that realistic and that a trade deal with the U.S. isn't really imminent. Um, from a lot of us that have been watching these kind of trade issues very closely, this is not surprising. Be, like I said, because the, the Trade Promotion Authority Act is, is being suspended, that means that submitting a UK-US trade deal to Congress would also have a lot of fault lines. And also, historically, um, the US and the UK have very different agreements around um, the standards that would be necessary for uh, trade of agricultural goods. Um, the US practice of, of washing chickens with chlorine solutions is a major contention with that. Um, so that was always going to be a difficult negotiation, even if you had the easier process through through Congress. 
in terms of the options, the there's been some rumors that that the UK would actually want to join uh, USMCA as as one of the things that they're considering as like a, a backdoor way to get an agreement with the US. But even that, the USMCA doesn't have a, a, a clause to add new members, so it would still have to go through the congressional uh, process in the US. So that's not likely. Um, what I think is possible and something that could happen over the next couple of years, if the US and the UK do uh, put enough political capital behind it, are narrow things or narrow agreements around trade that don't uh, touch tariffs. Because if they don't touch tariffs, then it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to go through uh, through the U.S. Congress, which means they can be executive agreements. So things around, um, for example, digital trade, things around um, you know reducing some non-tariff barriers. Those are things that could be negotiated, but those are much narrower in scope and much more difficult for um, for Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson to sell as a big trade deal um, with the United States that you know that that Brexiteers campaigned on um, five years ago. Matthew Bay is Stratfor senior global analyst with Rain. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. You can listen to our recent podcast on the U.S.-U.K.-Australia defense agreement at worldview.stratfor.com. While there, sign up for our free newsletter and stay up to date on the geopolitics of trade relations with Rain Worldview. Sign up today at worldview.stratfor.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.